In celebration of Black History Month, Hyundai is proud to support the OWN Network. Have you ever thought about your car personality? What's your vibe? Do you like the classic fully gas-powered engine? Are you a best-of-both-worlds type? Driving on battery power while keeping gas on reserve? Or are you more inclined to choose a convenient hybrid ride? Whichever your vibe, there's a Hyundai Tucson to match and a powertrain to get you there. Okay, Hyundai. Visit HyundaiUSA.com to learn more about the 2023 Hyundai Tucson. The 2023 Tucson Plug-in Hybrid is only sold in California, Colorado, Connecticut, Maine, Massachusetts, Maryland, New Jersey, New York, Oregon, Rhode Island, and Vermont. I'm Oprah Winfrey. Welcome to Super Soul Conversations, the podcast. I believe that one of the most valuable gifts you can give yourself is time. Taking time to be more fully present. Your journey to become more inspired and connected to the deeper world around us starts right now. Welcome to part two of our conversation. Tell us about, I think you actually had a dark night of the soul. Feels like it. It felt felt like a spiritual fever dream, like something mystical and mystical and miraculous was happening that actually brought you to the moment where you realized that your life needed to be of service for other people. Tell us about how we got to Me Too. So let me say, for the last four years, people have asked me the story of Me Too, and I have obviously never told that story because I thought, how do you say this in the public, right? How do you say this in the media, in a soundbite? People are going to think you have, you're have you not really well, yeah. right? Um, but I had to tell the whole story in the book, and I am I'm Christian, I, you know, and I was more of a practicing Christian at the time, and I do believe it was a, just a spiritual experience that needed to happen. And I think the way God has moved in my life, when I look now, God moves in my life very swiftly, very boldly. And I, you know, I look up one day and I'm here and I'm like, oh God, did you, you, you just said it two minutes ago. Why am I here already? You know? Um, And that night it was, I was so tired and I was, I don't know how to describe this feeling, but I'm trying not to give away the book too, but I had gone through all of these things in Selma. I was going through this really awful moment around all the sexual violence in Selma. And I had gotten comfortable with talking about what happened to me at seven at that time, but I never really explored the other things, right? There's actually another assault that I experienced that I don't even talk about in this book. And so by this time, I am overwrought. I guess is the word I can use. When I laid in that bed and I was trying to like, this is the thing I think a lot of survivors do. You think you can control, right? Mm -hmm. I only want to think about this. I don't want to think about that. I'm just, this is where I am. And it was these memories started coming to me, these flashes, these these, um, flashbacks, I think people call them, of the other abuse that I had experienced. Yes. And I thought, no, God, no. I don't, I don't go there. Right. This is, there's a shelf. I always imagine my life as having this, this like archive, you know, that stays up in the archives. We don't go there. And these flood of memories. And I felt like what God was doing was saying, you cannot get to where you need to go. If you can't see it all, if you can't see it all, face it all, look right at it. You know, a lot of times people say that the, the healing is right in the middle of the pain. Right. Yeah. You, you, you had a spiritual reckoning. You had a spiritual reckoning. And you know what? You need to thank Jesus right now because it saved you 25 years of therapy. Because you had you had in that. I thought, well, this is what you go through therapy for 10 years or 15 years yeah. to come out on the other side of it. But you were actually blessed enough to get all of that. But it had to feel like a wrenching dark night of the soul. It felt like being boxed, you know, like somebody uh, being in a boxing match, but not having any skills like me against Mike Tyson. It was my body was so tired. You know, I talk about my girlfriend came and got my child and Kaya was really intuitive as a child. Very intuitive. I I think even spoke to, you know, people who aren't here, Mm -hmm. but that's another story. But 
I I didn't want Kaya to to come in and try to help me. As weird as that sounds. So when my friend got Kaya out, it's almost like part one and part two. It really was like, okay, now here we go. The scene in that room, I had a mattress on the floors, you know, still broke back then. And I had all these papers around. I had written in my Bible. I had written on every little piece of paper, backs of envelopes that I could find. And I almost, I didn't even recall it. When I looked around, I just had all of this stuff and I started reading it like, okay, okay, okay. This is, this is something. And then I sat down and picked up that, that, that notebook and I just wrote me too. And it was, it was for me, actually, it wasn't like, I'm going to build this thing. It was like, this happened to me too. And I want to use this not just for myself, but this is what I need to say to the girls. Because I had the phrase empowerment through empathy before I had the phrase me too. And I have been talking about empathy in the seventh graders, right? These are seventh and eighth graders. They're not quite there yet. I need a different language for them. And it was like, forget about what I said for a second. Just look at Miss Tarana. Miss Tarana who loves you. Miss Tarana who will protect you. Miss Tarana who is there for you. This happened to me too. and. I don't, I think this isn't a book where I put, I used, I used black women who had talked about their stories. I used you, I used Maya Angelou and Gabrielle Union, Mary J. Blige and Queen Lights. I just used these stories because it was a way for me to connect with the girls and say, these people who you see in the world, you see them as larger than life and their lives are great and they, you admire them. You can be that because they have been you. Right. You can if they can get there, you can get there. They know what this is. It happened to them, too. And they, they're always stunned. I mean, I, I, I there's nothing better than that feeling of turning over. I would tell the story like I may tell your story, a, a, a version of your story. Yes. Say this is well, not this. It'll be the picture. And I turn the picture. and They go, oh, no. <laughs> it's it was an amazing tool. So, well. In the book's prologue, you write about how you reacted. I thought this was pretty brave of you to like tell the truth about this, how you reacted. Because when you first came up with Me Too, I think, wasn't it it like 2005 or 2007? 2005, yeah. Okay. So you've been working with young girls and doing the grassroots on the ground, trying to save girls. And I, I read a passage in the book that reminded me so much of, myself too, when you said, you know, you spend all this time, all this energy working, you're getting them two days a week, and then they go back to their own lives for the five days a week, and you got to start all over again. Yeah. I did that. It's why I eventually ended up creating a boarding school. Right. Because I wanted to be able to have the girls long enough to literally indoctrinate them into believing that there was another way. That's a whole other conversation. That's, that's, that was always a dream of mine to have. When you started that school, I thought this is the way to do it. Yeah, you, because I'd already done some of the work that you were so expert at. I'd already done trying to take the girls out of the projects and having all of my friends and the producers work with the girls. And, and then it's hard. It's so hard. It's so hard because everything you learned this week, they they're still going back right back into the same kind of thing. And they have to they have to live in, in that world and sur- and survive in, in that that world. Yeah. No, it's that never that work is why I'm here, right? Those those girls, that work in Selma and having to realizing I have to like wrap myself around them, but on un- knowing that I'm only a single person who can't do that. And it wasn't just me. It was my, my best friend was helping me. I had another, uh, my little ma who I mentioned in the story, Miss Anne. There were people who were pitching in, but it still just wasn't, it wasn't enough. Yes. So I'm saying this to say to everybody, you'd been working, working, working in the trenches with young girls, trying to get them to understand what, what it means to be groomed to literally using words that would help them to explain themselves and I- explain what had happened to them, to themselves, explain grooming, explaining that, that whole process and doing the work, but nobody's tweeting about it. Nobody's, you know, raving about it. And then you're at your house and Me Too starts trending on Twitter 
without any attribution to you. And you admit that your ego was clouding your judgment in the beginning. So tell us about that moment. So now you've been working on with these girls in the Me Too movement since 2005. And now it's 2017, fall of 2017. I remember October. That's right. And Me Too is trending. It was it was traumatic at first. It was, you know, this people started calling and texting me. Because again, in my community, and I've been doing this work a long time, so I have a pretty large network, I would say, of, of folks. I'm associated with this work. People know Toronto works with little girls. Toronto works with Black girls. Toronto does sexual violence, Me Too, all of that, Just Be. Um, but this was different. And I'm like, if these white folks get a hold of this work, it's over, right? What can I do? They won't credit me. They won't talk about me, right? And this is my work. And I kept on this, my work and my work and my work. And I do think to, on the one hand, it makes sense, right? There's a lot of Black women who create online and create things publicly who don't get credit. A lot of women of color who deal with their work being stolen and that kind of thing. But this is not like an influencer or being a creator on YouTube or something. This is different kind of work. And it was, I had to go through that and cycle through that moment of like panic and then actually kind of check in with what was happening online. Right. Because we I'd also seen things go viral before. Right. I'd seen hashtags go viral and how people go crazy about them. And then did, didn't you say to your friends or one of them said to you, well, maybe it won't be a big, big deal. Maybe it'll just die down. That's what I, I, said. Said. I was yeah. like, it'll probably die down. It'll be you know, <laughs> half in a week. You know? And then I read this woman's story online and it just it just sat me down again. I told you how God comes to me in this bold yeah, way. It's a stranger story who, because of Me Too trending in 2017, because of Harvey Weinstein, let me remind everybody, uh, I think Alyssa Milano is one who had first used the tweet, right? And so the it went viral. Everybody starts sharing their stories. You read a woman and you were like, what? This is I, me too. I'm the one that started this. What is everybody talking about? And then you read a tweet from a woman who was a complete stranger who felt because of the hashtag that she was able for the first time to reveal her story. And then there was story after story after story, a person saying, me too. Me too. And I knew, but see, because I had been using this, I know what it means and I know what it feels like. And I thought, you got to take yourself out of this. I, I had made the commitment to give my life to service and be in service of people a long time before. And so it was like, well, what does that actually mean? In this moment, this is it. This is it. This is the time to show up and and do be who you said you were. And if this is happening for these people, then maybe what I should be doing is inserting myself to say, hey, let me help direct the conversation. Not, hey, I own this. This is mine, y'all. Yeah, Give yeah, me some credit. Yeah, you know, yeah. this is that's not helpful, really. There's a thing happening. You have a particular skill set. You have a particular understanding. I need to lend that, try to lend that to the moment. And again, I feel like it's the grace of God that it happened. It's just like a perfect storm. Nobody and had so it. Then you put out, it has been amazing watching all of the pushback against Harvey Weinstein and in support of his accusers over the last week. In particular, today I've watched women on social media disclose their stories using the hashtag Me Too. It made my heart swell to see women using this idea, one that we call empowerment through empathy to not only show the world how widespread and pervasive sexual violence is, but also to let other survivors know they are not alone. And the point of the work we've done over the last decade, I see you got that in, hello. (laughs) We've been working for 10 years already, y'all. The point of the work we've done over the last decade with the Me Too movement is to let women, particularly young women of color, know that they are not alone. It's a movement. It's beyond a hashtag. It's the start of a larger conversation and a movement for radical community healing. Join us. I thought that was beautiful. I thought you pull that ego in, you put it in check. It's a monster. You know, you got to tuck it in sometimes. It made the difference. Can you imagine if my if my position had been, I want the world to know this is mine, and then it would just devolve into some fight. And I, I said, I kept, I always joke with my friends that I'll be some random trivia question. Who was the Black lady that said that she started Me Too? <laughs> <laughs> you know? 
like what was her name yeah, yeah what was her name like who would really care at the end of the day um and that's not really I, I didn't live my life and I hadn't done this work to be famous or to even be rec- who thought this was possible right that the yeah. world could have a sustained conversation about sexual violence I didn't even think it was possible so yeah I would agree I would agree because I am of that generation. You just took it. You were sexually harassed. You were, you know, marginalized. You were treated badly. You were, you just, that's what you did. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been four years now, as we started out saying, since uh, that those tweets started in the fall of 2017. Uh They've literally changed our culture. Some say we've rarely started the conversation. And there are many, as you know, who say it's gone too far. Some complain that there is no due process, that if men or very rarely women are publicly accused, they're automatically guilty in the court of public opinion. And you also hear people who are confused about the levels. So how do you define sexual assault versus an unwanted touch? I tell people all the time, I try to explain that sexual violence happens on a spectrum. And we always need to think about it happening on a spectrum. So the the rude language, the crude language, the the harassment and cat calls is on one side and you and you keep moving up. Somebody may touch you unwanted, but hasn't violated you, hasn't hasn't forced you to have sex without your consent. Right. And even around consent, like once you realize there's there is people who started off in a consensual matter and then revoked consent. And then there's this, just all the way to the other extreme of the person who jumps out the bushes and snatches the person and, and violates them. There's a, it's a huge spectrum. And if we can look at sexual violence on a spectrum, then we can look at accountability on a spectrum. And I think that it will help people understand that you have to take this piece by piece. These are not the same. They, they li- exist in the same spectrum, but they're not the same. And, and that's the way I try to help people see the difference between the two. But the other piece is that we work from a, from a law and order, you know, a crime and punishment framework all of the time, as opposed to a healing or a harm and a harm reduction uh, framework, because there's not laws that cover that whole spectrum, right? And there's all this debate in the spectrum about what should happen to this person and that. But if, if you start with the premise that you harmed a person, and you need to be accountable for that harm, then we can have a whole different conversation. And then it's not about due process and all of these legal terms. It's about what do human to human being, what do we owe one another when you cause somebody harm? Now there's the extreme harm on this end. Some people who are committing extreme harm, like jumping out of bushes or you know, forcing somebody to have sex without against their will, sometimes needs to be removed from the community and be re- rehabilitated away from people whether that's jail or something else, that's one end of the spectrum. But on the other end, when you harm somebody with your language, with an unwanted touch, things like that, accountability can look different based on the person. It has to be what I need as the person that was harmed to feel whole again. And and the conversation is so convoluted with who did what and how famous they are and who's going to jail and who's not going to jail that it becomes this, this really, really diluted and useless, basically, conversation. It doesn't help survivors. It doesn't help in sexual violence. And it puts us in this cycle, this never-ending cycle that doesn't make change. Well, you know, I think one of the things Me Too has certainly done is given voice to it. I recently interviewed Jennifer Hudson, who was talking about preparing to embody Aretha Franklin, and that one of the things about Aretha Franklin was that she had to learn how to like literally clip her voice and that there were there were times when if you were looking at her where she's really kind of biting inside her lips to to keep herself from saying what she needed to say. And we now know that she, too, was a victim of sexual violence. And Jennifer kept saying, you know, my generation of young women have learn how to take up the space. And I think what Me Too has done for a whole generation of young girls who didn't grow up the way we did, it it has given them voice to take up their own space. Take up the space, raise your voice, say it out loud, and know that there's a community to hold you, right? What Me Too does the best is create community. 
so that you know, not only you're not alone, but my gosh, unfortunate. It's like, it's unfortunate, but we are so. It's a big club. It's a, it's a vast club. Yeah. You know what? It's a powerful club because you've already survived the worst thing that you can and you've been surviving every day. So we really represent power and resilience more so than we represent something pitiful or victimized. And I yeah, think- and what we represent is overcoming the shame. That's why your book with Brene Brown is so impactful. Because again, I say it's not the act. It is the act, but it's what the act, how the act makes you feel, how you are forever colored by that act and how you now see yourself and the rest of the world. You say on page 212, the pain of watching folks twist themselves out of shape finding new ways to blame little black girls for their own abuse plays a part. And the general ranking of sexual violence is minor in the face of things like structural racism and poverty also play a role in how hard it is for us to stare down the monster that is sexual violence and call it out by name. So I want to know what what are we going to have to do in our society, in our culture, throughout the world to stare down the monster that is sexual violence and call it by name? I think we have to first say that out loud, right? We call sexual violence a public health crisis in an effort to help people understand just how big it is, how vast it is, how many people's lives it has touched. The more we talk about it, the more we talk openly about it, the more survivors who are able to are able not just to share your story, because I'm not an advocate of people just telling their stories for story's sake, but what survival looks like, what it looks like to live with this thing, then it helps people to understand. I don't think we could have got that verdict, for instance, with Harvey Weinstein five years ago, even if there wasn't this robust conversation about what survival looks like and what people are holding. So the world needs to see this as a social justice issue as a public health crisis, and as something that is not shameful, if we keep reiterating that message that you didn't do a thing, a thing was done to you, and you're not responsible for that, then people will feel more comfortable and not just talking about it, but also fighting against it, right? We have to fight against the culture that allows sexual violence to happen. And turns the other way. And in our community, especially, turns the other way, you know, and that whole... uh, won't reveal the book, but talking about a civil rights leader being revered in the community. And because you have the title, whatever that title may be, sometimes that title is famous celebrity. Sometimes that title is upstanding leader in the community. People are willing to look the other way. And that story was important for me to put in there because we have to talk about the complicity around the people too, right? Yeah. The people who don't say anything, the people who don't ring the bell, the people who look the other way, you have a role to play. Absolutely. You say, what does the world have to do? We have to see this as our collective responsibility. That's right. And not wait until it's your child. And then, so speaking of your child, the thing that I think the horror that every uh, victim of sexual violence carries with them is like, You're going to be overprotective of your child. You're going to do everything to make sure this doesn't happen to your child. And then one night, you asked Kaya, and they had the courage to tell you the truth. But more importantly, when I read that you asked Kaya, the courage to ask Kaya to me was the full circle moment because it meant that you had created capacity. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) When Kaya gave me the answer, I had such a mix of emotions because I I felt like failure, to be quite honest. My my initial reaction was this one thing that I needed to do, I failed at doing. Protect my child. Protect my child. But then I also knew that I had been given this gift, right? This work that I had been doing. I have these tools. I actually used one of the tools to get Kaya to talk with, with that I used with the girls, which is writing it down. And so it allowed me to approach to do with Kaya. Share with our audience what you did, because I think a lot of people think, well, I asked and she didn't say anything. This is the thing that I use when I used to do parenting workshops, uh, particularly in, the, in our community. We tend to just to grill our children or to have anybody mess with you. Somebody touch you. Somebody touch you. I'm gonna kill them. You know, we, we get that kind of thing. And that's not helpful to your child. And I would do a similar thing like that with Kaya until this day it came to me to say, 
you know, there's nothing that you can tell me that would separate you from my love. Nothing. Not there's there's nothing that you can ever do or say that would make mommy not love you. Because I need I realized I needed a cushion in there. They needed some some sense of safety. Mm-hmm. And when it dawned on me that Kaya felt exactly like I felt at, at, as a little baby, right? As a child, that I had done something wrong, that they had done something wrong. And so once I took that away and said, even if you think you did something wrong, mommy will still love you. It created the space for them to say, okay, this is the thing that happened. And they also felt complicit. Like I'm a bad, I was a bad child. And it changed everything. And it, it also set the tone for our relationship till now. I mean, my, my child is a mommy's child. It's mommy's little baby. And we have a close and really honest relationship that started from that point, changed how we communicate. And I try to tell my friend, I told everybody to listen. I even found emails from 2009 where I was writing people like, let me tell you what happened. <laughs> you know, talk to your child differently. Ask different questions. Yes, You write about once hearing about the butterfly effect, how the tiny flap of a butterfly's wings could lead to a tsunami on the other side of the world. So I want to know, do you ever think of yourself and your your evolution after what happened to you as that innocent seven-year-old little girl as the flapping of a butterfly wing that actually changed the world? Ooh, here come the tears again. Ooh. I don't think I've ever thought of myself as that. No. I But think about it. But think about it. <laughs> think about it now. I I mean, there's probably people who might say that, you know, who I get people who write me letters and say things like that all the time. It feels it has I've said this before, but it feels like a duty, you know. I'm so grateful to have survived. I'm so <sighs> I'm just grateful. I'm so yeah. grateful that, that God saw fit to see me worthy and make me see my worth enough to put it into the world and use me as a vessel in that way. Um, that I don't think of being like supernatural or, you know, that kind of thing. I just want to do my work. I just want to take this thing that was given to me and get it out to as many people as possible. Yeah. I, yeah. It's, it's not supernatural, Tarana. It actually is what Maya used to say. Wouldn't take nothing for my journey now, for my journey now. Wouldn't take nothing because everything that happened to you is what has put you in this space. And you have done the thing that we as human beings are supposed to do. You take the thing that you've been given and that you had absolutely no control over and that caused you so much pain and angst and rage And you turn that into your greatest power. That is what you've done, Tarana Burke. Amen. Amen. I thank you for Unbound. Thank you. Thank you. I I have so many thank yous for you. (laughs) Thank you. No, 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 no. You did did the work. You know, I talked about reading about Maya Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, but absolutely the shows that you did, because, you know, I had that same mother, too, that was four yeah. o'clock every single day um, or taped it and we watched it later. Yeah. Those good. shows that you did were, I mean, I know you've heard this so many times, but they just were life-changing. I know so many friends who have said, I saw this episode and it made me realize, or this is when I knew I could talk about it. And the fact that we were able to do this together, that I could do Unbound on your imprint, it just all feels divine. It just all feels in line. I used your story to help the girls I worked with. Your story helped me. Now your story's helping me. <laughs> <laughs> that whole capacity thing is huge for me. Uh, that, that's so huge for me. I could just break down and cry right now because what I realized is, oh, that was it. That's the word. It wasn't that my mother didn't love me. It's that she just didn't have the capacity the capacity. So yes, the, 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 you know, I think everybody who reads it will find what they need in the pages of Unbound. That's when you know you've done your work, when it, it, it feeds what people need 
and it is there as an offering to serve whatever those 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 needs are. And that only happens when you tell the truth. Amen. Amen. Okay. Go soul to soul with me here for a minute. Okay. Okay. I want to know, um, do you believe in a God, a universal force, love, spiritual consciousness, a unified field, whatever by, by whatever name do you call it? And if so, how does that show up for you? What tells you it's there? I believe in God. Um, and I believe God is a universal force. And the way my survival <laughs> is really how it's shown up for me. The fact that I sometimes feel like I shouldn't, not that I even shouldn't be here, but I shouldn't even know this. I shouldn't, where is this coming from? I can only explain it by this divine force that is God moving in my life. And it's just been, I get, I get, I move away from it sometimes and I can tell, I can track my life by how far I've moved and how far I come back. Yeah. Right. You know, and it's just so I can't I can't ever deny it. I can't say anything else. Everything that's happened in the last four years. But God. Yeah. <laughs> right? Showed up. Yeah. yeah. Showed up and said yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. And may not come when you want them to, as we say, but always on time. Um, on time. What What was your greatest awakening? Oh, my gosh. I had so many awakenings. I don't know that. My greatest awakening, you know, I, I will say my latest greatest awakening is when Me Too went viral and all of this stuff started happening. I realized as much as I talk about hope and joy and dreams that I did not dream big enough, that I still had put these limits to what I could do or what I could be or what I could contribute to the world. And because I would get to a certain place and say, well, you know, that's not going to happen. So let's just, I'll just dream in this box. And God has been showing me a bigger box all this time. And instead of trying to live into that, I've lived into the box that I carved out of what he did. And so that was a huge, I was going to say, aha, I'm not trying to use your word. (laughs) Take it. (laughs) Go ahead. Aha. Revelation. That's a big revelation. revelation. It was a revelation. Okay. What was your greatest suffering and what wisdom did you gain from it? Mm. <sighs> Had a lot of suffering too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think this is hard to talk about. I think that my relationship with my mother um, and the evolution of that relationship, we're, we're very close now and I just... She's the most important, you know, thing to me. But that, the moments, the time in my life when I thought that she didn't love me. And then when I, as I progressed and realized, oh, this is something different. This is how love shows up for her. How love shows up for her. And I could sort of adjust and understand that. That wisdom is what has kept us. It's why we have a relationship. It's it helps me understand. And actually the dedication to her is that I want my mother to know freedom. Yes. I want her to know freedom so badly in the way that I know it, because that revelation gave me freedom. And I don't know what her stuff is. And I don't, I don't have a real clear picture of the things. I know some stuff that happened, but I just want the truth in this book, as hard as it is to face, to be something that's freeing for her too. Describe a time when you lost your internal compass and how you were able to get it back. (laughs) Oh, boy. I (laughs) have lost my internal compass. So I think that when I was in Selma and when it got really, really hairy there, and I know right from wrong. I know when I'm supposed to move. I know when I'm supposed to be obedient. And there were times during my time there that I definitely lost my internal compass. I just felt like I was being obedient to people as opposed to my God and myself. Your voice. The voice that I, you know, that I, that I know I have. And it just, it took me way off course. And every time that happens, it takes so long to get back. So, I mean, I've lost it a few, I've lost it for men. You know, it's a few times I've been in relationships that is like, you don't belong here, you know? And I, I remember very clearly being in a relationship and saying, not only do you not belong here, I don't have to be here. Like having that epiphany, like, wait, 
I actually don't have to be here. I don't have to take this. I don't have to do this. I know myself. Um, and it led me to this relationship. I just got married in December. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. Nobody really knows. It was this little okay. secret wedding. <laughs> it's not a secret, but you know. Yeah. But I'd been off and on with my husband for 30 years. I met him when I was 16. And he came to me and with such force and was like, you are the person. You've always been the person, it's, you know, when are you, whenever you're ready. And I said, I know what heartbreak looks like. I know what struggle and pain looks like in a relationship. I don't really know what it looks like to be loved and fully loved and accept love and love back. And so if this doesn't turn out right and this turns into heartbreak, at least I know I'll survive. <laughs> I know I'll live because I've done it before, but I don't know what it is to step in and allow somebody to love me. And so I don't know if that answers your question. I don't forgot the question. Yeah, it does. It did. It, it did. <laughs> tell tell about, about, about your compass. It was, you answered the compass question. I want to know what fills you with awe and when was the last time you felt awe? My child fills me with awe. Kaya is, is I, always, I always joke and say I overshot. <laughs> Kaya is so free and so um, not fearless, but just liberated in a way that I could not imagine feeling at their age. And I'm in awe of how they move through the world. You know, I my child is like, I am non-binary and polyamorous and queer and I have pink hair and blonde hair this day and and I'm just like you don't feel a little you know you know I have these moments of like you're not embarrassed no you just want to say it okay you know? and I just I really am in awe and they're so honest they will say to me um you know mommy that thing you said the other day it kind of hurt my feelings I know you were trying to be you know, direct or whatever, but it, I, it just hurt my feelings. And I'm like, Oh, okay. You know, and it allows us to have these different, I mean, I'm just in awe that I, if I had that, Oh my gosh, at 23. Well, you have done the work because you know, what we were talking earlier about capacity, it takes full capacity and openness as a parent to be able to say, Oh, your hair is pink right now. Oh, you decided to shave it all off. Oh, fine. Yeah. I can tell you I ain't there yet, but okay. <laughs> now, let me just say, I'm not, I don't want to paint a picture because when the, when the piercing started, I was like, oh, oh, you know, <laughs> are you sure? You know, I was just. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I got some thoughts on that with my, my girls. And they're like, oh, Mama, oh, are you being judgmental? Yes, I am, honey. That's what this is. It's called judgment. <laughs> my child put a picture on Twitter in a bikini one time and was dancing. It was a video and they were dancing. And I called, I was like, get that video off of the internet. It's the internet. And they were like, feminist mother, are you saying that I, and I was like, <clears throat> let me say this. <laughs> <laughs> I reserve the right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have multitudes. You have multitudes. I'm a feminist and I want that off the internet. Take it off the internet and we'll discuss and debate later. <laughs> okay. I get that. So final question. What do you think or believe is your true offering to the world besides your child, <laughs> besides your family? Hmm. <sighs> I think, I don't know. I think honesty I think it is my offering to the world is to take the experiences that I had and the experiences that I see around me and to talk about them honestly, to be honest about how they impact me and to create spaces where people also can be honest. I just think so much like unkindness, so much dishonesty has just derailed conversations, uh, relationships. And so my offering to the world is to be as authentic and honest as I can be, because that's what I have, right? I have all of this stuff. It feels like I have these stories. I have these experiences and I can rot in them or I can talk about what I'm doing to survive them and how I can see space for other people and just try to be an example. <sighs> okay, final, final. What's next with Me Too? Where is it going to take us? So now you have you have this offering to the world. You're using your life. You're taking the pain. You turned it into something really powerful. What's next? Where do we go from here? 
what where we go is, you know, the Me Too movement and the work that we do hasn't really changed. And so what's next is this sense of liberation that I have. I want other survivors to have it. But I also want to spread a message of what I was saying about collective responsibility. So what's next is that we help people to understand that in order for that to happen, like we should be thinking there were 12 million people use that hashtag in 24 hours. And we still haven't really responded to them. Wow. Right. Me too is what you say to say this happened to me. And then what happens after that? And so we're trying to, I'm trying to do the work of what happens after that. That's interesting. That's fascinating. That there was 12 million people who responded to that hashtag. In 24 oh, wow. hours. In 24 hours. Yeah. We owe them something. And that's because a girl child ain't safe in a world full of men. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> great conversation. Great conversation. I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. I oh, appreciate it. Appreciate it. This work that we do is around shifting narrative too and shifting culture. And if we didn't hear some of the things that you've said, if mm-hmm. people, I'll never forget the episode you did when you talked to perpetrators, people who had mm-hmm. pedophiles, right? And they talked about grooming the kids. That was, there's just been so much groundwork laid. Yeah. That, done that allows us to not, so it's not foreign to people when we start talking and doing this work and we all have a role to play and you've just played such a big role. Well, thank you. You know, that perpetrator, that, that thing freed me because that was the first time I realized it's a plan. It's It's a a strategy. They, you are chosen. It's the first time I realized that my cousin tickling my toes and playing the game and then they, that, that, that was that had been thought out. He, that was that was that was actually really the most. You gave. I remember. I, that's always the episode that comes to my mind. I was same fascination. I was like, this is. Listen to the strategy they have. Listen to how long the long game that they have. It was that father with his daughter and then the other man. I, I just. I remember it. Yeah, I never forget that father. He said he he had gone and then he said he had decided he had started playing games with the daughter, and he had he had worked on it for months. Months to be able to get to the point where he could rub up against her breast because he had done the knees and he'd done the thighs and he played the games and that he had d- made the decision that today I'm going to touch the breast and see what kind of reaction I get. It burned in my mind. Me too. Me too. That was that was a major me too moment <laughs> because I went, whoa, I had no idea up until then. You know, I thought it was just like these random things that were always happening. And yeah. Yeah. No, uh, you've just done such tremendous work. And so. Do you remember what he said, though, Toronto, that he went to his wife? I went to the wife, which I always hated when men objectify. I went to the wife because I thought she would go to the wife and I wanted to get to the wife first. And I told her that she had this bad reaction so that when she went to her mother, her mother would say, oh, he already came to me and he didn't mean anything by that. That got me, too, because I thought, wow. Think of everything. They think of everything. They're covering the tracks. They're covering the bases. Do you know how many times I've thought of the day that I was assaulted at seven? I was with two other friends in the candy store. And I just think, why did he pick me? Why of the three of us did he pick me? To say, come with me. And there's, and I don't, you know, I don't know, but I just imagine he probably had been watching. Had been watching you and knows that you're the one. Yeah. I'm the one. She's friendly enough. She's this, she's yes, that. That's right. And it's not you. It's a plan that it just helped me. It just helped so many of us so oh, much. Thank so. you. The fact that you remember that too. That was, that was a big one for me too. Anyway, we'll talk again. God bless. God bless. I'm so glad I got to talk it out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm gl- this is my first conversation about it. So it also uh-huh. helped me to get the uh-huh. tears out a little bit. <laughs> so thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for all this time. I appreciate it, really. I appreciate you. All right. God bless. I'm Oprah Winfrey, and you've been listening to Super Soul Conversations, the podcast. You can follow Super Soul on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. If you haven't yet, go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Join me next week for another Super Soul Conversation. Thank you for listening.